While you're standing, open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians is found over in the New Testament, over somewhere by Timothy and between Timothy and Colossians or somewhere over in there. Praise God. When you get it, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you're a guest this morning, thank you for being here. God bless you so much. We are honored that you're here. All of you that are watching online around the world, thank you. Praise God. I, I just want you to know if you're a guest this morning online or here in person, I want you to know you're inside of a good church. I've been doing church for 40 years. I preached my first sermon in 1980 in Slidell, Louisiana. I've been able to pastor and travel all over this country. And I want you to know that you're inside of a good church this morning. Amen. Praise God. And I give God praise for you. The sermon I'm getting ready to preach to you, I could not preach it to you if this was not a good church. Because most churches could not handle what I'm getting ready to say. Come on, smile at me, somebody. If you're already frowning, it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> no, it ain't like that. How many, I mean, let me ask you a question. Let's, let's just do this real quickly so we can all get on the same page. How many believes this book? Come on, if you believe this book, raise your hand. I mean, it's the Bible, right? And uh, how many of you know that it means what it says? I'm not worried about your interpretation. You just read it and obey it. Okay? Let's, let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13 in... Uh, in the King James Version, our associate pastor would be so proud of me from reading from the King James this morning. He is, he is a King James kind of guy. But you know what? Before I ever met him, I used to say this, though. People love that King James because they can't understand it. <laughs> they, all those these and thous and those. Pray God. No Baptist people love that stuff. <laughs> I'm glad we're friends. Praise God. And we beseech. See, what, what's beseech mean? We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sakes and be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourself. You may be seated. See, now, there's some words in there. Can you bring that back up just real quickly? There's a couple words in there that are really kind of strong that we don't have a clue what they mean. I looked up the word admonish this morning. It is not what I thought it was. Matter of fact, I thank God for Brother Google, right? I, I Googled it, and Google said, admonish, and it began to read it, and Tina said, Oh, my goodness, I would have never dreamed. That's what admonish means. Now, don't, don't everybody say, Google, what does, I mean, and we have phones going off everywhere. When you get home, you can do it. But that word admonish there is so powerful because it gives a pastor, a leader, an opportunity to, to preach to you and to love you and to try to protect you. Do you know that one of the responsibilities of a pastor is to try to protect you? In, in, in the Old you know, they're referred to as watchmen. The watchmen, especially in the Old Testament, were men that sat up on the wall, and, and they would look out to see if there was any danger coming in, and if they could see danger, they would warn everybody inside of the city. And when you look over to the New Testament, a pastor is referred to at times as a watchman because he's not sitting on a wall, but, but, but he's watching. He's watching your life, and he's making sure, trying to make sure that you're protected because the devil is a thief. The devil would like to steal from you. The devil would like to take away from you. The devil would like to kill you. 
That's why it's important for you to have a man and a woman of God into your life and brothers and sisters because all of us together have got to make sure that the devil leaves us alone and stays away from us and that we can have victory in our lives. So that word admonish, let's look at this same scripture in the message translation because the message kind of breaks it down a little bit, right? And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. Get along among yourselves. Get along among yourselves. <laughs> Get along among yourselves. Let the world fight. There shouldn't be no fights inside of the house of God. That's why we don't talk politics. Because there's people in this room that got strong beliefs. They will argue with you all day long. And when you both go home, you're, all, you're both going to believe the same thing. You're going to go back to your Fox News. And they're going to go back to their CNN. And we just keep on getting indoctrinated. This past week has been a mockery in this country. Bottom line, any red-blooded American has to be embarrassed at just everything. But you know what? We can't fix that. Well, maybe we can. The only thing is when we vote all of them out, we put somebody else back. They're the same way. So you and I are never going to fix those issues. The Bible simply says in the scripture that, that we must be at peace amongst ourselves. We, we, we must be able to bring that up for me. Get along among yourselves, each of you, doing your part. Our counsel is that you warn the freeloaders to get a move on. I'm not even going to touch that. I'm just going to pause long enough for you to read it. Gently encourage the stragglers and reach out for the exhausted, pulling them to their feet. Be patient with each person. God help you and I to just learn to be patient with one another. Listen, as a pastor of this church, I'm not going to always please you. I can't spend my life trying to please you because if I please you, then the person sitting over from you, I, I don't please them. So I walk into this pulpit every Sunday morning. I've got one I've got to please. It's not my wife. It's not my children. It's not you. There's only one I have to please. It's the one that has called me to preach the word of the Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the only one I have to please. If I ever get to the place where I become a people pleaser, if I become a people pleaser, then I cannot do what God's called me to do. Because there were times he walked into the temple and he kicked over the tables, threw the money changers out. Everybody wants to talk about how lovely God is. There's times when God gets ticked off. There were a time if Moses had not stood up for the children of Israel, God would have killed every one of them. And then there were other times when Moses wanted God to kill him. And God stepped on the scene and said, no. Check this out. What if Moses and God 
would have had a bad day on the same day. <laughs> that would be tough. We wouldn't be worried about Israel this morning. In a Frank and Ernest cartoon, the two bunglers are standing before the pearly gates. St. Peter's holding the keys, and, and he's just looking at both of them. Frank whispers over to Ernie, if I were you, I'd change my shirt. Ernie's T-shirt reads, question authority. As Americans, we think that questioning authority or defying authority is our inalienable constitutional right. If our president begins to try to act like a king, we, we will show him who's boss. If one party or the other makes us upset, we will show them who's boss come November. And it's kind of built on the inside of us, as Americans, we resist the concept of authority. We don't like submitting to anyone. Do you know that the Bible tells me that I should submit myself to my spouse? But you know the Bible goes a step further and says, I should submit myself to you? That brothers and sisters, we are to submit ourselves to one another. Do you know that the Bible teaches that you should submit yourself to the pastor in your life? We can't bring the same spirit the same way that we look at politics and the president, all that kind of stuff. We cannot allow that same spirit to get inside of our spiritual lives. When it comes to the church, most American evangelicals do not view it as a place where you should submit to the leadership for the purpose of growth and accountability, but rather as a store where you shop as a consumer. If you like the place and its services, your needs, you come back. If another place down the road offers a more pleasant experience, you move your business there. And because of that, pastors who are trying to market their church to the king, which is the consumer, Jesus is no longer the king. The consumer is king. That's how come we live in a generation where you don't hear very many preachers anymore saying, thus saith the Lord. Thus says the Lord seems kind of odd and kind of out of the place because all churches are consumed with is how are we going to take care of the customer? If you fail to say, thus saith the Lord, if you fail to preach the word of the Lord, then you're not taking care of the customer. Because you and I, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word's going to stand forever. You and I must be built upon the word of the Lord. Whatever this book says, all I need is for somebody to preach it to me, for somebody to tell me what it says, for somebody, come on, I don't want somebody just to pat me on my back and brag about me and tell me how good I am. I want somebody that's going to preach me to heaven. I want somebody to tell me that hell is hot, that heaven is beautiful, that eternity is long. I just want somebody somebody to tell me what the book says. If you're looking for a consumer church, you're in the wrong place. God help any preacher who's afraid that he's going to upset the customer. I would rather upset you than upset him. Listen, I'm not talking about being mean I'm not talking about preaching mean. I'm not talking about all that. I, I know what all that stuff is. I'm just talking about afraid to preach the word. Hebrews chapter 13, 
verse 17 in the message. Be responsive to your pastoral leaders. Listen to their counsel. They are alert to the condition of your lives and work under the strict supervision of God. Contribute to their joy of the leadership, not as drudgery. Why would you want to make things like that happen? Why, why would you want to be a negative? When you can be a joy to the pastoral leadership, when, when you can bring happiness, why would you want to be a drudgery to them? The scripture talks about that's not profitable for you. The ideal of spiritual authority scares us because of wackos like Jim Jones, the cult leader who killed over 900 followers back in the 1970s. Or we think of cult leaders who arrange marriages and demand their, that followers turn over all their assets to the cult and blindly follow orders. Even in less extreme situations, many Christians have had bad experiences with authoritarian pastors who wrongly lord over the flock. Oftentimes, these men mistakenly claim that you can't touch the Lord's anointed, meaning that the pastor is beyond criticism. A lot of times in churches, they will allow pastors to stay in a position, even when they know that pastor is living in sin. Several months ago, a man walked into my office. He was a police officer. He walked into my office and he sat down. He introduced himself. He said, my friends told me I need to come see you. I said, well, feel free to say whatever you want to say. And he said, my wife's having an affair. And I'm getting ready to kill the man. And I could tell he wasn't playing. He was past the point of just being angry and saying something. He was very calm, but made it very plain. I'm getting ready to kill the guy. I said, do you know who he is? And he said, yes. And he told me. It was a local pastor. So trying to come to the defense, I said, well, you know, maybe. Da, 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 and I tried to make up every kind of excuse I could make up and and. He reached into his pocket and he threw pictures on the coffee table. He said, look at those. And I did. After counseling with him a few times, I said, listen, here's what I want you to do. I said, I've got two or three friends that sits on the board of that church. I want you to request a meeting with that board. I want you to take all of your stuff. Tell them that I sent you. And, and I want you to go and have a right spirit, have a right attitude, and present everything that you presented to me. And he did. After presenting everything... The board kind of just put their head down, and this is what they told him. They said, literally, there's really nothing we can do because we're guilty of the same thing. Not one man on that board. Spoke up and said, whoa, 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 I, I, no, don't, don't put me in that group. I'm not guilty of that. The man just sat there, gathered up his stuff, walked out of the room, 
and came back to me. A lot of times churches and pastors and leadership, they label anyone who speaks out as divisive or contentious. But they totally misunderstand true biblical authority. True biblical authority is not allowing a man who's committing adultery to stay in that pulpit just because that's what he's always done. God help you and I. The church has got to clean this mess up. I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about all churches. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what nationality, what language they speak. It doesn't matter. It is time for the church to cleanse itself. The Bible says at the end time that we will be spotless and wrinkless, that we should not have any blemishes on us. That God's going to present to himself a glorious church. Not a backslidden church. Not a beat down church. Not a bunch of whoremongering churches. Call me old school. Call me whatever you want to call me. It's not the will of God for the organist to be a homosexual and we allow him to play just because he's good. How are we ever going to change the world if we're doing the same thing the world's doing? If we act like the world, walk like the world, talk like the world, do everything that the world's doing, then how are we ever going to make a difference in this world? The Bible teaches that we should be a light in the dark place. When you walk on your job, you ought to live such a life that a light walks on your job. No matter who's doing what, every time you walk in, you don't have to wear a cross on you. You don't have to walk around saying, I'm a Christian. You should just live such a life that when you walk in the room, that people know who you are. If on your job, everybody's comfortable with telling you the same dirty jokes they tell everybody else, then there's something wrong with you. Clay, stand up for me, will you? Clay, you're taller than I am. I'm on the stage. What's wrong with that? Where, where's your championship rings are in softball, right? Is that world champion softball, right? So Clay, Clay has two or three or maybe more world champion softball rings. Clay for a traveling team many years. He was in my office this weekend. You'll understand more a little bit later. He was in my office this week. He and he and Wilma and, and we're talking. And he said, man, pastor, he said, out there traveling or whatever, he said, man, women will just offer themselves and will just come up to you and da 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 But he said, you know what is so cool, pastor? He said, when they come up and say something, he said, my teammates will say, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't, don't mess with him. You, you, don't, you don't mess with the pastor. He's a pastor of the baseball team. You don't, you don't mess with him. He don't do stuff like that. Everywhere he goes, everywhere. I mean, there, I'm sure there were times in his life he had to say it. But because he's lived consistently like that, he don't have to say it no more. Everybody around him says it. They protect him. Thank you, sir. You, you ought to hear the way he tells it because 
It, it is amazing. And he's a psychologist and he, and he teaches with homes and families and marriages and whatever. But, but to hear him talk about how that his teammates will actually surround him and say, you don't mess with him. He, he, he ain't the drinking kind. He ain't the smoking kind. He ain't the partying kind. He ain't going to sleep with you. Leave him alone. He's married. He's a man of God. Da, 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 da. Wouldn't it be great if all of us lived such lives that everywhere we would go that people would say, uh-uh, don't mess with him. Don't mess with her. That's a man of God. That's a woman of God. He don't live like that. I, I don't care how good looking he is. I don't care how far he can hit the ball. He's married. He's got children. He lives. Come on. He lives a godly life. Anybody can be a whore. Excuse me. I should have said it like that. There ain't no difference in a woman whore and a man whore. A whore is a whore. Well, my children, that's why your children should be over there. Because this is an X-rated class right here. PG's across the driveway. We can get plain in here. You know why we get plain in here? Because I don't want you to misunderstand me. I don't want you going home and saying, what, what, what do you think he was trying to say? I promise you, when you go home, you ain't got to say that. <laughs> when you get in your car today, you're going to say, whoa, I understood everything he said. <laughs> now I just got to digest it. We don't need preachers standing up here preaching, excuse me, King James kind of preaching. Dear brothers today, we are gathered here today. Now we ain't gathered here, we sitting here. We country. I don't want somebody to preach to me and they get done and I'm trying to figure out, oh, what do they mean? What do they say? No, just preach me the word. Preach me the word. Preach me the word. Come on. Be yes and in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke. Don't let anybody stop you from just hearing the word of God. I don't want a consumer church. I want a church filled with people that want to go to heaven. Listen, I believe in blessings, but I can't preach blessings every Sunday. I believe in favor. I can't preach favor every Sunday. I live in favor. And if you don't know what it is, you need to check it out. The number one thing that churches are battling today is this. The number one thing, everything you read. They don't have no money. That's why their church signs look ridiculous. That's why the yards, well, ain't, well ain't the reason why the yards ain't motivated. Everybody's just lazy. But a lot of them, that's why there's no upkeep on the building. That's why all, all the different things is, is just because there might be a whole lot of people sitting there. But you know what? If a whole lot of people give a dollar, you're just going to have a whole bunch of dollars. Pastor Kim was here last Sunday morning, and she took up an offering at the end. And by the look of the crowd that came to the altar, you would have thought, there's got to be thousands of dollars in there. There was $1,000. My wife and I gave 100 of it. And some of you probably gave 100 of it. Everybody else just gave whatever. It wasn't even enough to pay, pay, pay for plane tickets. But if we didn't know any better, you say, well, if it wasn't enough to pay for it, how did we pay for it? We paid for it, we paid for it good, and she's wanting to come back. They start drilling Monday in Africa. Uh-huh.
We're getting ready to give clean water to 5,000 people every day, every day. No more walking three miles. No more walking six miles. They're going to be able to go get the water right there. And get There's three types of wells. If I understand it right, I guess like a, a Volkswagen, a Chevrolet, and a Cadillac. You know we didn't give them the Volkswagen. And you know we didn't give them the Chevrolet. Because if I understood it right, at certain seasons, if we would have went with the middle line, it could go dry. We're not putting a well in Africa for it to go dry. We're putting a well in Africa, Jordan, for it to pump out water. So I told him, you go as deep as you have to go. I don't care if you have to come out on the side of New York. <laughs> we want that well pumping water. And there's a group from here going the first week of November to Cadell, Africa. And we're going to turn that switch on. At about 4.30 on the afternoon, because on 10.30 on Sunday morning, you're going to be watching it live right here. Come on, don't you love technology? While we're in Africa, turn it on to water, passing out water to everybody, you're going to be sitting here going, Whoa! Whoa! Ain't that cool? Ain't that cool? Little Jake's over here will be going, get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> Inside joke. But can you imagine me sitting here? Oh, that'll be like the first, the, that'll be the second Sunday of November, I think. Be sitting right here, and we go live to Cadell, Africa, which will be about 4.30 in the afternoon over there. And because of your sacrificial giving, while well, we spent like 14000 for the land or something, about... 18 or 20,000 for the well. I don't, I don't have the exact figures. Between 30 and 40,000 dollars. And you know what? We didn't twist nobody's arm. Some people gave five bucks, some gave 500, some gave 5,000. Matter of fact, Tina, I need to pay mine today. I made a $3,000 commitment, Tina and I. Sorry, babe. I got a little cash. I ain't got that much on me. I wouldn't told her. Praise God. But listen, our commitments are due here by another week or two or whatever it is. But just think the lives that we're going to change. So, so we do that. The month of July, we took the whole month of July and just went into the community and done work all over the community. We shut down everything except for on Sundays, and, and, and we fixed, and we painted, and we did all kinds of work. Pastor Clint Brown just told you that we gave him the largest offering that's ever been given to him to touch pastors' lives. We're blessed today. We're blessed today. We're blessed. And I don't ever want to lose that blessing. It's worked for us thus far. And it will continue to work for us. There's people in this building that ever since they became a part of this church, their income just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. It's almost embarrassing. But you know what? 
That's the way it should be. Because you're inside of a blessed house. You're inside of a blessed house. Somebody say praise the Lord.